Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to St. Destin. Can you hear me clearly? If at any time my voice fades, please let me know. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you uh, to our conference. This year, as you probably have noted, uh, we've adopted a totally different format. Instead of having a series of didactic lectures and uh, discussion at the end, we're going to have the whole session based on cases. We're going to present you a series of cases, and with each case, we're going to ask you a series of questions, and you'll respond, so we'll have an instantaneous feedback, and we'll be able to adjust what we're telling you to your responses. If uh, everybody agrees on one uh, question and the issue is, is okay, we'll just move on to the next one. Otherwise, we'll keep discussing until everybody is in agreement. It's quite a change from uh, the routine setup. And uh, I, I want to start by saying how grateful and appreciative I am to uh, Sandy Bame, who's agreed to work with me on this entirely new venture. It's really virgin territory that uh, we are exploring uh, during this session. I also would like to take this opportunity of thanking very much uh, Mandy Stone and Randy Glick. Uh, without their help, this program would not have been possible. It's, uh, thank you very much, Mandy. Randy, thank you very much, and Sandy, thank you very much for being here. So let's uh, start straight away. The first session is going to concentrate just on the diagnosis. So we'll present you various cases some of them are straightforward, others are more challenging. The second session is going to be how to initiate treatment. And they're the same patients. So we diagnose this first and then how to initiate treatment. And then the third session today is going to be how to monitor the patient's response to treatment. Tomorrow we have two sessions, one on secondary osteoporosis and the other one on uh, some possible rare complications of osteoporosis. And finally, on Sunday, we're going to have a potpourri of challenging cases. So once again, I would like to welcome each and every one of you. I also would like to welcome very much uh, the people who have elected to watch us on a webcast. There are quite a few people all over the U.S. who have joined us. I'd like to extend you to a very warm welcome. So let's start with the first session, which, as I said earlier, is going to be devoted to the diagnosis of osteoporosis. And this is our first case. Uh, Mr. A is a 67-year-old man. He's referred by his orthopedic surgeon. He's two weeks post hip fracture, and he sustained that hip fracture after tripping over a small rug in the bathroom, in the bedroom. Uh, the man has been, is leading an active physical lifestyle. He travels extensively. He's got a well-balanced diet, a good daily calcium and vitamin D intake. He, however, is experiencing severe GERD, and he's on omeprazole, 40 milligrams once a day. He doesn't smoke cigarettes, does not abuse, abuse alcohol, doesn't have an excessive sodium intake. Recent physical exam, he weighs 165 pounds, 66 inches tall. There is no height loss. His blood pressure is 145 over 83, no orthostasis, and the clinical exam is otherwise unremarkable. His metabolic profile, lipid profile, CBC, and serum vitamin D level are all within normal limits. He also is on Zolpidem, 12.5 milligrams, no other medication. His family history is negative for osteoporosis. Given this data that you have displayed on the screen here at the top, the questions now are, does this man have osteoporosis? Has he sustained a fragility fracture of the femoral neck? Does he need a DEXA scan to confirm the diagnosis? And is it A and B, or is it A, B, and C? Cast your vote, please.
Okay. So the answers um, four uh, said that the man has osteoporosis. Three that he sustained a femoral neck fracture. Seven need a DEXA scan to confirm the diagnosis, and we've got the various combinations. The main message that we would like to put through, and it is a very, very, very important message, and we're going to cover it uh, as we go along because this is a crucial one, is that a fragility fracture, which is what the man had, is diagnostic of osteoporosis. You do not need a DEXA scan to confirm the diagnosis. You need a DEXA scan to establish a baseline to monitor the patient's response to treatment, but you do not need a DEXA scan to confirm the diagnosis. So the man has sustained a fragility fracture. It is a fragility because he tripped over a carpet and fell in his bedroom. This is not excessive trauma. By definition, a fragility fracture is a fracture that occurs as a result of trauma that ordinarily you wouldn't expect it to cause a fracture. The other definition is that it occurs after a fall from the standing position. So this man has sustained a fragility fracture, and this in, by its own is diagnostic of osteoporosis. You do not need a DEXA scan to confirm the diagnosis. You need it to have a baseline. Are we clear? Send it. So one of the other <clears throat> major things that we have to remember are that uh, atraumatic fractures, even without significant energy, meaning a fall from a standing height, are also associated with this underlying diagnosis of fragility. So many patients that have uh, unsuspected vertebral fractures have really atraumatic fractures. They may just twist a little in the shower, pick up a half a gallon of milk or a quart of milk, uh, on the breakfast table, and they sustain a fracture. They didn't even know they sustained a fracture. And most individuals, most women who have sustained a verbal fracture, confirmed by x-ray, did not even appreciate that they had a verbal fracture. So, so fragility fractures are low trauma, low energy, but also atraumatic in nature, and we should be aware of that. Thank you. And this really is a very, very important point. We'll come back to it later. doesn't matter what fracture. If it is a fragility fracture, that patient has osteoporosis. Okay, let's move on. So the next question is about fragility fractures. And you probably know the answer by now. The options are a fragility fracture results from a fall not exceeding standing body height, frequently <coughs> occurs spontaneously, are suggestive of osteoporosis, are associated with a good prognosis, and if it is A and B, then you should pick up E. Cast your votes, please. I think we've got our total here. I'm very glad most people feel that fragility fractures are the result of from a fall not exceeding standing body height and frequently occur spontaneously, which is here. That's the majority, and you're absolutely right. Are associated with a good prognosis. It varies quite a lot according to the site of the fracture. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Hip fractures are associated with an abysmal prognosis. Uh, silent vertebral fractures, on the other hand, are silent, and the patient doesn't know until she's having a, an imaging study for whatever reason. Okay, let's move on. Fragility fractures are also known as low trauma fractures, atraumatic fractures, low energy fractures, A and C. Uh, e is covering A, B, and C. There, this is covering it. Uh, 
I think we've got the majority, and it's unfortunate that this is covering A, B, and C. Uh, the correct answer is A, B, and C, fragility fracture, also known as low trauma, atraumatic, or low energy fractures. Orthopedic surgeons understand there are about three or four orthopedic surgeons, at least in my group, I don't know about yours, Sandy, they're very fond of the term low energy fracture. It's a fragility fracture. Okay, let's move on. The next question is about the prognosis of hip fractures. And after a hip fracture, one-year mortality is increased by 24%. 40% of the survivors have some degree of disability interfering with their daily activities. About 20% are so disabled as to need long-term custodial care. And 20% only 20% are able to resume their pre-fracture activities. Cast your votes, please. <coughs> you guys are absolutely right. I think we can take a break and go home and enjoy the rest of the weekend. This is the point that we're really trying to make. Fragility fractures of the hip are associated with a dismal prognosis. Um, so, any questions so far? Let's move on. The following is true about osteoporotic fractures. Most fractures are preceded by falls. Most falls lead to fractures. Many fractures occur spontaneously, and A and C or A, B and C. Okay, and uh, most fractures are preceded by falls, and this is absolutely correct. Uh, although many fractures occur while the patient is turning, trying to reach something, but by and large, most fractures are preceded by falls. However, it's important to realize that most falls do not result in a fracture. In fact, only about 5% of the falls result in fractures. And this is a very important clinical point because it gives us an opportunity to actually intervene. The patient comes with repeated falls. That patient is a very good candidate for a fracture later on. And it behooves us as clinicians to pick up these patients before a fracture is sustained, especially as the outlook after a fracture is so dismal. So the patient who comes with a history of repeated falls is worthwhile investigating for osteoporosis to find out how his or her bones are. If she's got osteoporosis, then this is a good opportunity to initiate treatment after diagnosing osteoporosis. It gives us a therapeutic option to initiate treatment before the fracture is sustained. Many fractures occur spontaneously. This is also correct. Any questions so far, Sandy? Well, I think we should also be appreciative of fact that uh, approximately 1% uh, of those falls result in hip fractures. So there is a low percentage, but there's a significant uh, adverse outcome for these falls that result in fractures. So 1% of those uh, actually occur uh, and certainly are associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Okay, let's move on. Uh, the following is or are true about repeated falls in older people. About 40% are due to hazardous environmental factors, like a loose carpet, a trailing wire, low furniture. About 40% are due to some disease, such as orthostatic hypotension, diabetes, Parkinson's, mm -hmm. epilepsy, peripheral neuropathy, and, or medication the patient is taking and 40% are due to inadequate perception of the environment. The patient has cataract, has glaucoma, has macular degeneration, any of these conditions. <coughs> and the consensus is? OK, 
Okay, we've got the majority, 27. We've got the majority, and um, the correct answer, 40% are due to hazardous environmental factors, as I said, like a loose carpets. I've practiced geriatric medicine over three continents, and everywhere I've been to, loose carpets are very common with older people. Small rugs, one foot, maybe two foot, two feet long, they very much are fond of this. They like them. They are everywhere, in the bedroom, in the bathroom, on the stairs, everywhere, these little carpets. If we have time, I'll tell you a few stories at the end of the conference. Uh, trailing wires are another uh, factor. Uh, another factor, too, are very low furniture or just clutter. So 40% of the falls in older people are just due to hazardous environmental environments, and 40% are due to some disease or medication the patient is taking, in particular hypnotics, sedatives, psychotropic agents, but also diuretics, and also um, medication that may interfere with the stability. And it's only 20% or less that are due to an inadequate perception of the environment, not only cataract, glaucoma, and macular degeneration, but especially bifocal lenses. Because if you think about it for a second, the lower, in bifocal glasses, the lower lens is for reading, for near vision. And yet when the person walks, the area immediately around the feet is perceived by the lower lens, which is meant for reading, so it is all distorted. And this is one of the reasons people who use bifocal glasses are very likely to fall, especially if they're going up and down the stairs. So the correct answer is 40, 40, and less than 20%. We'll talk more about falls as we go along. But what I would like to do in this next question is talk for a little bit about the post-fall syndrome, well-known syndrome, unfortunately is not diagnosed often enough, and very frequently it is overlooked. So, the post-fall syndrome, is it due to an exaggerated fear, anxiety about falling and fracturing? Is it associated with muscle wasting and unsteadiness? Does it need to be addressed prior to discharge home? And cast your vote, please. And I'm so glad you guys agree, that's the correct answer. It is uh, the three. It is the, the patient is so much afraid of falling that the patient spends most of the day sitting in the chair or even lying in bed. Unfortunately, by reducing their physical activity, their muscles start to waste, they become more unsteady, they try to stand up, they feel unsteady and they start wobbling. It gives them another reason for sitting and not exercising, and they get themselves in a vicious circle, which I will explore with you in a few minutes. And it's very important that it be addressed prior to discharge, because after a hip fracture, no matter how good your surgeon is, unless the patient is rehabilitated, unless there is enough muscle mass, unless the patient is able to walk independently, complications are likely to occur. And so, another point would be sure. that these individuals, our senior population, also have underlying sarcopenia. So they have significant underlying uh, poor muscle power, strength, endurance, etc. And then having a fracture and being immobilized uh, worsens this to a dramatic extent. And so it's really important to mobilize people and keep them mobilized uh, immediately after fracture, too as part of their physiatry and PTOT program. And Sandy, now that you mentioned it, can you please just a couple of minutes on the sarcopenia? Sure, sarcopenia is a progressive uh, weakness of muscle groups as we age, and this is due to uh, poor conditioning, deconditioning, infiltrate, infiltration uh, uh, with fat as we age. Uh, and this can, this is treated by uh, increasing aerobic activity in our aged population, muscle toning strength, weight training, that can accomplish this, that can improve uh, functioning 
and decreased fracture risk by decreasing falls. So this is a uh, term that's used. It's more commonly used at this time and uh, is certainly something that we should be attuned to in our aged or patients that uh, have disuse as part of underlying diseases. But this is a common uh, element in our aging population that needs to be addressed and can be attenuated to some extent. Uh, and this is a, a major issue. And sarcopenia is such an important and prevalent issue that in one of the issues of the Journal of Clinical Densitometry, we're having a whole symposium, a whole issue, just devoted to sarcopenia to increase the awareness. So if you're interested, please check JCD, the Journal of Clinical Densitometry, for this year. If you have any difficulties, please contact me, and uh, I'll make sure you get uh, notified. Okay, so what are the take-home messages? The first one, which is very important to remember, is that fragility fracture, also known as low energy, low trauma, or atraumatic fracture, are in themselves diagnostic of osteoporosis. You can confidently make the diagnosis, clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis, just based on the fact that the patient has a fragility fracture, including an asymptomatic vertebral compression fracture discovered accidentally during imaging. They may also occur spontaneously, and they also often occur after a fall from standing height. Uh, they are associated with hip fractures, are associated with a poor prognosis, about 20% mortality, one-year mortality in women, and it is even higher in men. About 20% need, need long-term institutional care, and 40% experience some type of disability. And it's only about 20% of the survivors who can resume their daily activities. Hip fractures are, in effect, life-changing events. And whenever I see a patient who has osteoporosis, who tells me, Doc, I've been quite all right, I'm now 68 years old, haven't had any fracture, I feel fine, why should I take your medication? My answer is, if God forbid you sustain a hip fracture, this is what you expect. You won't be able to enjoy retirement, you won't be able to travel, you won't be able to visit your kids and grandkids, you're likely to be uh, institutionalized. So it is a life-changing event, and we really need to emphasize this to our patients. We'll talk more about this when we talk about monitoring patients and encouraging them to continue with their medication. Another important uh, uh, issue is that many fractures, like most fractures, are preceded by, by falls, but most falls do not lead to fractures. And this gives us a very good therapeutic opportunity to identify these patients who are particularly at risk of sustaining fractures. We'll talk more about fracture risk assessment later on in the day, but I'm just going to put a plug in FRAX, which is one of the risk factor assessments that most of us, or in fact, virtually all of us use unfortunately does not take into account whether or not the patient falls, as opposed to some other risk fracture assessment which do take this into account. But falls, the take home message, this is a therapeutic window. It's an invitation for you guys to start initiating treatment, making the patient aware that she has osteoporosis and now it can be helped. Uh, causes of falls, either intrinsic, diseases or medication, extrinsic in the environment, or poor perception of the environment. Any questions on anything we said so far on this case? Well, one of the other things... Uh, you Excuse know, me, Sandy. Yes. Can you guys hear Dr. Bain when he's talking, or do we need to increase the volume? Should I stand up? Okay. Okay. So, uh, how many of you used Frax? How many of you used Garvin calculator for risk from Australia? So the Garvin calculator, you can go online at any time, actually is inclusive of falls. And it, there's quite a difference if you frax the patient or, or use Garvin to estimate their fracture risk based on falls risk. And the number of falls per previous 12 months increases the patient's fracture risk in the Garvin fracture risk calculator. So it's very interesting to see, as uh, Dr. Hamdi had mentioned, that increasing falls, the number of falls in the preceding 12 months, 
is a major factor in regard to fracture risk in this other calculator. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, I, G A R V A N. We'll talk more about this in a couple of minutes. Okay, let's move on to the next case. Oh, uh, I think we can skip all this. Well, sorry. Uh, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that fractures are the result of diminished bone strength, which, is, which reflects the bone mass, the amount of crystallization, the crystal size, and the quality of, um, of the bone itself. And then you have the bone quality, which is affected by the bone architecture and the geometry of the bone. So the bone mass and quality affect bone strength, which also affects the fractures. Bone remodeling directly interferes with or affects the bone quality and the bone mass. The geometry itself of the bone may be another issue, and we're looking here at the hip axis length. I'll show you a couple of slides in a minute. And there it is. If you look at this length of this hip axis compared to this one, this one appears to be longer. And the other thing is that the femoral neck angle is different in these two patients, and this may also affect, and I know Dr. Baim has done quite a lot of work and is chairing the session on uh, geometry of the femoral neck. He'll talk to you about this in a few minutes, unless you want to do it now. Well, <clears throat> I'm not on the expert panel, but I'm not chairing. Okay. So the, this uh, year's uh, ISCD annual meeting has a position development conference, and one of the topics is hip axis length and angle. And we're going to be discussing this to determine its predictability, can it be used for diagnosis, institution of treatment, and a variety of other issues. And that's next week. So if any of you want to return to the upper north uh, woods in Chicago for the annual meeting, that's occurring in about a week, at which time this is one of the topics for the ISCD an um, annual meeting position development conference. So this is the hip axis length. And we also have the femoral neck angle. You can see these two angles here. And this would also affect the likelihood of the bone sustaining a fracture. And these are two different angles of uh, the femoral neck. We shouldn't forget, and unfortunately many people do um, forget, that in addition to bone mass and bone quality and bone remodeling, there is a big group of factors that affect whether or not, that determine whether or not the patient fractures, and these are patient factors. We already talked about this, environmental factors. So when we diagnose osteoporosis, it's not really just enough to look at bone mass and bone quality. We also need to look at what else can cause these fractures given the low bone mass, and this is false. And we talked about this a lot, but I really emphasize it because it is an area that is underdiagnosed. And it's so simple. If you pick up the patient is on a medication, a hypnotic, just stopping it would change. If instead of the patient taking um, her furosemide first thing in the morning, she takes it before going to bed because she's a little bit confused, it causes nocturnal polyuria, that patient is going to get up in the middle of the night, she's sleepy, she's drowsy, she's likely to fall on her way to the bathroom and break a hip. Review of medication is terribly, terribly important, especially in older people, especially if they have osteoporosis, because you can reduce the risk of falls and subsequent fractures. So going very quickly, what do we look for when we make a diagnosis of osteoporosis? We have the bone density, the bone quality. We want to make sure that the patient doesn't have any diseases that may predispose to osteoporosis. And we'll talk about secondary osteoporosis tomorrow morning. Many diseases like primary hyperparathyroidism and a few other diseases. But also, we mustn't forget the iatrogenic causes. Very high on this list is corticosteroid-induced osteoporosis. Again, we'll talk about this uh, tomorrow. And now we can measure turnover. And all these factors affect the bone strength, which in turn would affect the risk of fractures. When we talk about falls, as we mentioned, we've got the intrinsic factors within the body. We have, what did I do? Oh. 
okay, intrinsic factors. We have the iatrogenic factors, increasing the risk of falls leading to fractures. We've got the extrinsic factors, environmental hazards, and finally, we have poor perception. So ideally, when you make the diagnosis of osteoporosis, it's not just the T-score. Because if you have two patients who have exactly the same T-score, but one falls five, six times a day, and the other one plays tennis, the one who falls is much more likely to fracture than the one who plays tennis, unless she's not a very good tennis player and falls. So this is why it's so important to evaluate all these factors as far as the bones are concerned, but of equal importance also to investigate whether or not the patient falls. And your interference, your intervention with falls, reducing the amount of falls, can significantly reduce the risk of fractures. And this is why we're spending so much time this conference to talk about falls, because it is an area that is very much under um, diagnosed and under-treated, and the surgeons can do a terrific job fixing the hip. They do now a very, very good job. But the patient has repeated falls. Sooner or later, she'll fracture the other hip. We can help these patients quite a lot. Okay, let's move on to our second patient. And this patient is a 70-year-old white lady, and she sustained very severe excruciating pain while watching TV. The pain occurred spontaneously, no trauma at all. The pain is localized to the mid-back, and it has no specific radiation. A diagnosis of vertebral compression fracture of T8 was made. She was taken to the ER, the X-ray her, and there is a vertebral compression fracture of T8. She has no neurological deficit. Prior to the vertebral fracture, she was mentally good and physically independent. She has a good daily dietary intake of calcium, doesn't smoke cigarettes, doesn't abuse alcohol, no excessive sodium intake. Her family history is negative for osteoporosis. Given this scenario, ah, oh, you guys are quick. Uh, the typical clinical picture of uncomplicated clinical vertebral fractures include sudden onset of severe localized back pain, no radiation, localized tenderness on the spine of the affected vertebra, localized increased muscle tone and the adjacent paravertebral muscles. And so far, the majority of people say it's a combination of these three. And you are absolutely correct. These three are uh, represent the typical clinical picture of uncomplicated vertebral compression fractures. Now, let's see if everybody has been awake and listening to what we've been saying. Randy, did I do anything wrong? No, no, no. no. So, the next question is, clinical vertebral compression fractures, are they diagnostic of osteoporosis or are they suggestive of osteoporosis? And I think you guys are doing extraordinary well. Thank you very much. But, uh, clinical vertebral fractures, which are not due to trauma, are diagnostic of osteoporosis. Again, fragility fracture means osteoporosis, regardless of where they are. Okay, let's move on. Vertebral compression fractures are the second commonest um, osteoporosis, uh, are the second most common osteoporotic fracture are often due to direct trauma. We're talking of osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. Most occur while the patient is carrying on with her daily activities. Mm -hmm. The back pain lasts about eight weeks and then resolves spontaneously and are associated with neurological deficit. Okay, uh, vertebral, osteoporotic vertebral fracture are not the second most common, are the first most common. Remember, there are so many vertebrae. 
but only two hips and two radii, but so many vertebrae. So vertebral fractures or superotic are the most common type of fractures. They're atraumatic or due to low trauma. Majority are atraumatic occurring while the patient <coughs> is carrying on with her daily activities, often just sitting around watching TV or knitting. Most occur while the patient is carrying on their daily activities. Uh, this is the correct answer. Back pain lasts about eight weeks and then resolves spontaneously. Um, and they're not associated with neurological deficit. Any questions? Sandy? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we need to appreciate that uh, there are about 800,000 vertebral fractures that occur in the U.S. annually, and about 300,000 or 350,000 uh, hip fractures. So these are very frequent. Uh, as Ron had mentioned, the majority are asymptomatic. So when we look at the registration trials for drugs that are used in osteoporosis, we know that a majority of these fractures had occurred and the patient is not aware of them. So, and these are radiographs that are performed as part of baseline of evaluation of patients in the registration trials. And then throughout the registration trials, they repeat x-rays and find all these fractures that have occurred uh, in primarily the pl placebo groups. And so this is documented evidence that uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of all morphologically proven, meaning x-ray proven, spine fractures are asymptomatic or not picked up by the patient or their physician, obviously, as part of their exam. And so this is a key issue that uh, Ron is presenting to us and must be considered, and we'll discuss this as we proceed through the lecture series, as part of our assessment of patients when they see us uh, in the clinic as physicians, nurses, uh, PAs. It doesn't matter. We have to think about uh, other potential reasons for fracture, but certainly documenting those fractures as part of our diagnosis. Any patient with a morphologically proven fracture, no matter what the bone density test shows, has a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis, which preempts the bone density diagnosis. And the sad thing is that even, sorry, we're going to, I didn't cut you off. Did no, 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 no. The sad thing is that very often the radiologists would report on the presence of a vertebral compression fracture in the body of the report, but would not include it in the summary. So when the husband, the residents, the interns look at the report, they usually look at the conclusion and often do not look at the whole details. And the fracture, even though it is reported in the body, because it is not in the conclusion, it goes unnoticed. And sometimes it even goes in the conclusion but at the end of the day, it's not reported by the treating physician. Yeah, and this is really a key point. I don't know if anyone else in the, uh, uh, of the attendees have noticed this, but in your reports, when you look at the x-ray reports, sometimes they do say that there are x-ray changes in the vertebra, but they don't actually come out and say these are vertebral compression fractures. They, in some of the reports I've seen, it's actually verbal deformities or degenerative deformities of the spinal bones at blah, 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 blah levels. They don't come out sometimes. The radiologists actually don't come out and say they're vertebral fractures. And so when I then retrospectively go to ask them, why did you say this? Well, this is how we've been reporting this forever. And so there is a, a knowledge base here, even in the, our radiologic colleagues' Uh, ret, uh, ret in regard to their uh, review and, and disclosure of verbal fractures that are very different sometimes. And so we have to be uh, attuned to their language and hopefully educate them as well to the true uh, uh, knowledge base of verbal fractures and how we actually uh, state them in reports. Okay, let's move on. The next question is about vertebral the diagnosis of vertebral compression fractures can be diagnosed by an anteroposterior DEXA scan of the lumbar vertebrae, a vertebral fracture assessment scan of the thoracolumbar vertebrae, 
a total body DEXA scan, A and B, or A, B and C. Cast your votes, please. Okay, the key word in the stem of the question is can be diagnosed. So you can diagnose a vertebral compression fracture by looking at the AP DEXA scan, and I'll give you the details in a couple of seconds. You can also diagnose it with a vertebral fracture uh, assessment. The advantage of the VFA is that you can look at the vertebrae from the fourth thoracic down to the sacrum as opposed to the AP DEXA scan of the lumbar vertebrae when you only look at L1 to L4. Total body DEXA scan, everybody agrees, you cannot diagnose vertebral compression fractures on a total body scan. So the correct answer is A and B. How many of you actually have uh, reviewed or ordered vertebral fracture assessments? So very few actually. It's a very useful tool. We'll talk much more about it uh, later on. Let me move on to the next questions. What are the characteristic features of a well-positioned lumbar vertebrae? Because uh, it really is important to have a look at these uh, uh, plates of the scan to make sure that it is correct, that it is well done. So lumbar vertebrae are central and there is an equal amount of soft tissue on either side of the vertebrae. And this is very important because it allows the algorithm to differentiate soft tissue from bone tissue. So you must have an equal amount of soft tissue on either side of the vertebrae, otherwise the algorithm would not be properly applied. You need to be able to see the pelvic bones on either side of the lower part of the scan and you also need to be able to, to see, to visualize the lower ribs on either side of the upper part of the scan. Correct answer is A, B, and C, and all of you have got it. This is tremendous. Let me see. There, this is a good uh, scan of the lumbar vertebrae. You see the vertebrae are central, equal amount of soft tissue on either side. The vertebrae themselves are in the midline, straight line. You can see the pelvic bone there and you can see the lower ribs there. This is a very good scan. And I always tell my residents, my interns, and the fellows who come and visit me, it's very important to look at the scan. Very much like Ronald Reagan, the late president, used to say, trust, but verify. He was not talking about Dexa. He was talking about the Soviet Union. But his motto was, trust them, but at the same time, verify. And it's the same thing with Dexa scan. We need to trust our densitometrist, the technician, the physician interpreting the scan, but we also should verify what they're telling us. So we've already <laughs> talked about all these. The other important thing is that there is a gradual increase in the size of the vertebra and of the BMD as we move from L1 to L2 to L3, and L4 may be the same as L3 uh, or uh, higher. Okay, question. In a normal AP lumbar vertebrae of the DEXA scan, the height and surface area of each vertebra gradually increases from L1 to L3, 4. The BMD of each vertebra gradually increases L1 to L3. The T-score of each vertebra is within one standard deviation from the adjacent vertebrae. And cast your votes, please. And you guys are very attentive, you've been paying attention and obviously are quite knowledgeable about the condition. The three are absolutely correct and when you interpret the scan, it's very important to look at uh, the surface area 
of the vertebrae to look at the BMD and also to look at these uh, T-scores. And this is what's going to help you establish the diagnosis of a vertebral compression fracture. Okay, so if you look here at the area, L1 is 12 point something, L2 13, L3 14, L4 16. There is a gradual increase in the surface area. This is very reassuring. The patient doesn't look as if she sustained a vertebral compression fracture. You then look at the BMD and it gradually increases. You look at the T-score and they're all within one standard deviation. This patient doesn't have any vertebral compression fracture. Compare her, okay, so the question is, what are the lumbar vertebrae, the, BM, the densitometric finding of the lumbar vertebrae that are suggestive of vertebral compression fracture? A surface area which is smaller than the vertebra immediately above it. We said the surface area gradually increases from L1 to L3, L4. A BMD that is higher than the vertebra immediately below it. We said the BMD should gradually increase. And a T-score that is more than one stand deviation of the adjacent vertebrae and cast your vote. And you are absolutely right, it's a combination of these three factors. Not just one, because if it's only one of these three, it's either an artifact or the, the, your technologist didn't position the lines identifying the various vertebrae correctly. How many of you actually review your bone densities? So Perfect. About, that's really fantastic. Perfect because it's like a chest x-ray. It's no different when you're reviewing your patient's uh, chest x-ray for underlying disease processes and that specific clinical uh, indication. It's no different than VEXA. We should be able to review these because of what Dr. Hamdi said. Sometimes uh, they're not read correctly. We're not assured of that reading. So it's no different than a chest x-ray. You should be very comfortable reviewing the images and numerical data to confirm what the interpretive report says. That's a key issue for DEXA, because we do see many DEXAs uh, in which the interpretation is incorrect, because they're not certified. Many DEXA bone density testing centers are not certified. They're not educated to bone density testing and interpretation, and that's a key issue today. So it's important for everyone to review these images and the numerical data is being outlined. Again, we trust, but still have to verify. So let's move on. And uh, here, this is the one we saw earlier, but compare this scan here. If you look at the surface area, L1 is, I can't see from here, 17, 14, 17, 19. Clearly, there is something wrong there. We expect it to actually increase, not decrease, and then increase. So we're going to keep an eye on this. We look at the bone density. It is 0 0.8, 1.29, 0 1.20, 1.0. Again, the density there is higher. And you look at the T-score, minus 1.7, 1 1.8, 0 0.9, minus 0 0.2. There is a big difference there. In fact, if you look at the plane, you see that the surface area there <laughs> is smaller as opposed to surface area that gradually increases. So all these are suggestive of a vertebral compression fracture. You may want to look at the lateral view, or you may want to also look at the VFA, but these findings are very suggestive of a vertebral compression fracture. So. Let's move on to the next question, and uh, the question is, when scans of one or more vertebra cannot be properly interpreted, what should you do? If only one vertebra is affected, it should be excluded, and the BMC, bone mineral content, the area, the bone mineral density, and the T-scores calculated based on the remaining three vertebrae that can be properly analyzed. Do you do this? 
If two vertebrae are affected, they should be excluded. If three vertebrae are affected, they should be excluded. And eventually, you base your diagnosis on a single vertebra. And the consensus is that you should not use one single vertebra even if the three others are not interpreted. The ISCD, International Society of Clinical Densitometry, has taken a very, um, very strict position, very clear position on this issue that if one vertebra cannot be interpreted, you can use the remaining three. If two are not interpretable, you can use the remaining two, but if three are not interpretable, you cannot, cannot use base your diagnosis on a single vertebra. By the same token, if you have the T-score of one vertebra clearly out of line with the others, you cannot base your diagnosis on the T-score of that single vertebra. You need at least two vertebrae. And if you don't have two vertebrae that can be interpreted, then we still have the hip and we also have the distal radius site that we can look at. But the pitfall to avoid is basing your diagnosis on either the lowest vertebra, the lowest T-score of the vertebra, or just based on one vertebra because you've excluded the others because of artifact, vertebral compression fractures, or whatever. Are we clear on this? That's a very, very important issue because I still see it every now and then, the report coming from a densitometry saying the patient has osteoporosis in L3 which is wrong. You cannot base your diagnosis on just one vertebra. Okay, let's move on. The following is or are true. In older individuals, the lumbar vertebrae scan are less useful to diagnose osteopenia or osteoporosis. DEXA scans are not able to differentiate intravertebral from extravertebral bone mineral deposition. Calcified aortic plaques or osteophytes interfere with the interpretation of DEXA scans. And your answers, please. And the majority are correct. It is, in fact, all these are quite correct. OK. Let's move on to the last question in this case. Multiple vertebral compression fractures, including the silent morphometric ones, are associated with sleep disorders, increased mortality, increased fracture risk, or any combination thereof. And the majority is correct. It is a combination of these three. And as I mentioned, this also includes the asymptomatic, the silent vertebral compression fractures. OK, let's move on. What are the take home messages? The first one is that clinical vertebral compression fractures present the sudden onset of severe localized back pain. Fragility fractures, including the vertebral compression fractures are diagnostic of osteoporosis. The, the characteristics of a well-positioned DEXA scan of the lumbar vertebrae, the vertebrae are central, you see the ribs, you see the iliac crest, no artifacts, and the intervertebral disc lines properly positioned. When you look at the, the systematic features of vertebral compression fracture, they include a smaller surface area than the vertebrae above, 
a higher BMD than the vertebra below, and a T-score more than one standard deviation out of line with the adjacent two vertebrae. And the impact of osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures, including the silent asymptomatic morphometric fractures, are increased mortality and increased psychophysical uh, morbidity. Now, I'd like to share with you a few DEXA scans. And here, when you look at the area, 18 for L1, 16 L2, 18 and 18, this is out of line. You look at the BMD, 0 0.8, 0 0.98, 0 0.36, 0 0.36, out of line. T-score also appears to be out of line. This is very suggestive of a vertebral compression fractures. What about this man? He's 50 years old. He's got Crohn's disease. There is the BMD of L1, 1.02. L2 is 1.2. L3 is 1.5, L4 is 1.0, and you look at the T-scores, minus 1.1, minus 0 0.2, plus 2.7, minus 1.9. What do you think is happening there? There is obviously something out of line, especially with this vertebra. See how much out of line it is. Any guesses what is going on? This is what is going on. The man just had an imaging study of the colon, and the barium is overlying this vertebra. You would never guess without actually looking at the vertebra. We must emphasize that, uh, because we see a lot of DEXA studies, that the interpreters don't look at the images. That's, the, that's a very common entity, uh, a common occurrence, actually. So it behooves us to review these DEXAs, the numerical data and images, because of what uh, Dr. Hamdi had just mentioned. We're talking about a, uh, how many standard deviation differences? Well, L3 three from L4. 2.7 as a, yeah. 2.7 as plus a plus minus 0 .3. And minus 1.9. We're talking about a four or five different, uh, full uh, standard deviation difference. There's something obviously there. Could this be something other than barium? Could this be osteoblastic disease, meaning metastatic bone disease? Could this be a benign tumor? Could this be something totally different? So it's really important to look at images and numerical data because they're often missed in the interpretive reports. And the thing to do with this patient is wait for a couple of weeks, repeat the scan, and there is the scan repeated in the same patient. It is a good scan. See how central it is. The pelvic bones are seen vertebrae are seen, equal amount of soft tissue on either side. And now we have 1.0, 1.2, 1.2, 1.0. The T-score are getting much closer to each other. Um, and you just cannot interpret. And what the technologists should have done, or the densitometrists, is cannot be interpreted because of previous imaging studies. It's also important to note that at the hip or the spine, having one or two vertebra or one hip being uh, affected by artifact, whether it's internal or external artifact, will change your total hip or the total spine BMD report. It will offset the other vertebra or the mean total hip, meaning using both hips in the analysis. So what we, we, we see this, that uh, one hip could have a, uh, or, a, uh, or a total hip arthroplasty, it's not recognized. And it offsets the uh, opposite hip, which actually has osteoporosis. And many bone density testing centers then take the mean, both hips, in their analysis and in, the, in their report without actually looking at the images. I know you're looking at me and saying, oh my God, can you imagine that? It happens. Same thing with the spine. If you have two vertebra, that are very high, it'll offset your bone density at the two that you would like delete from the analysis. And the patient actually has osteoporosis at the other two that should be considered in the final diagnostic evaluation. So these things are common. It's not unusual. Let me share with you just one. Yes? With that second scan, you still just use L1 to L3, correct? Because L4 starts to fall out of the 
No, no, you can use L4 too. As I said, L4 sometimes is the same as L3. Occasionally, it may even be less. But you really have no reason here to exclude L4. I think what you're asking is if it's over one standard deviation difference. So if we look at L3 and L4, is that over one standard? Yeah, correct. So it's within one standard deviation difference. And the, and the position uh, is over one standard deviation. Deviation. And it's a combination of three BMD, surface area, and T score. Yes, sir. Did they actually send out a report on that first scan for the DEXA center? I didn't hear the question. Uh, did they send a report uh, of that first DEXA and say that the patient had normal BMD and all that? The top scan with that variant, that was actually sent to the physician. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're not kidding. This, this, is, this is not unusual to see these DEXA reports come through. Let me share with you another example. We need to move on. So this is another 72-year-old uh, gentleman. Um, so L1 is BMD 1.8, 0 0.9 L2, 1.01, 1.02, 1 L3 and L4. You look at the T-score plus 5.4, minus 2.6, minus 1.8, minus 1.8. Clearly, there is something going on there, and you should not. I always tell my students, residents, and fellows, unless the surface area gradually increases, unless the BMD gradually increases, unless the T-score is within one standard deviation of the two adjacent vertebrae, you cannot interpret the scan. You need, need to look at the plate. But as Dr. Bain was saying, very frequently, people don't look at the image. They don't look at the individual values. They just concentrate on L1 to L4 and draw their conclusions. If the interpreting physician or densitometrist only looked at the plate, this is what you would see. And clearly, you cannot include this one in the rest of the average. This patient had osteoblastic deposits. And it's important in the report to say that there is a localized increased density that may need to be further investigated. How the clinician investigates this, that's his problem or his prerogative. Okay, are we ready to move on to case three? We're going to speed up the process a little bit now because we've already covered quite a lot of material. So this patient here is a 72-year-old lady. Uh, she has a QCT done because she's, um, okay, because she's been hospitalized, sorry, while being hospitalized for pneumonia, a QCT shows morphometric vertebral compression fracture of T. Seven. She is asymptomatic. She was just hospitalized because of pneumonia. They did the CT. They picked up this. She responded well to the treatment of pneumonia. She's discharged home, and now she comes to the uh, clinic. She lives on her own. She has a normal mental status, physically independent, socially active, 135 pounds, height 63 inches, no significant findings. Her mother has sustained a fragility hip fracture. And this is a very important risk factor for fractures, for this patient to fracture. Common cause of secondary osteoporosis have been ruled out. So the question now is morphometric. By morphometric, we mean clinically silent vertebral fractures that we identified during imaging for some other condition or even for osteoporosis. So morphometric vertebral compression fractures are clinically silent incidentally discovered during imaging for some other uh, condition and frequently not reported. And it looks as if you guys have been very attentive. You really need to be complimented. <laughs> and uh, the correct answer is a combination of these three. We've already covered this material. So unless there is any pressing question, I'm going to move on to the next question. Morphometric vertebral compression fractures are diagnostic of osteoporosis are incidental findings of no clinical importance, have the same implications as clinical, that is symptomatic vertebral compression fractures, and the last is A and C.
and I really feel privileged to be here standing with you. You guys are doing very well. Not only do I have a very good clinician as uh, a course uh, collaborator with me, and not only do I have Randy and Mandy uh, helping me out, but you guys are doing very well. Congratulations. That's a very good answer. Okay. What's one other uh, point to be made is that um, uh, uh, grade one mild vertebral fractures may not, may not have the same implications for future fracture risk as grade two or three. Grade one is mild, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk, yeah, we'll. Versus moderate and severe fractures, mm -hmm. versus clinical, meaning clinically apparent fractures, and we'll talk about that. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Now we're talking about the clinical manifestations of multiple vertebral compression fractures. These clinical manifestations include arm span exceeding body height, reduced space between the lower edge of the ribs and the pelvic cavity, and a height loss that is documented. And you're still doing very well. This is the correct answer. The three of these are clinical manifestations of uh, multiple vertebral compression fractures. Normally, the arm span, which is distance between the tip of the finger, of the middle finger of the outstretched hand to the other outstretched hand, equals body height. You can only measure this if the patient is able to fully extend her arms. If the patient has arthritis, deformities, and just is able to extend it that much, that's not enough. If the patient cannot extend it more than this, that's not enough. Please do not do it. It's worthless. It only gives wrong information. So only if the patient, very few patients are really able to fully extend their arms. Um, okay, let's move on. So the next question, the vertebral fracture assessment done by bone densitometry called VFA visualizes the following vertebrae. T4 to the sacrum, T6 to L1, T8 to L3, T12 to sacrum, or L1 to L5. We're talking of the vertebral fracture assessment, not the <coughs> lateral lumbar vertebrae. and the majority of you are quite correct. If properly done, it identifies from T4 to the sacrum. Uh, often, however, you look at the plates and one part is very visible, usually the lumbar vertebrae and the lower upper thoracic are not clearly visible, but your technician, while interpreting the scan, can change the brightness and the contrast and really visualize each vertebra from T4 to the sacrum. Okay. Vertebral compression fractures can be graded. Sandy, this is your, uh, you just mentioned it. So you can grade the severity of the vertebral compression fractures by measuring the anterior, the posterior, and the midpoint heights of the affected vertebra by visually inspecting the shape of the vertebra and comparing this with a scale by the severity of the pain, or by A and B, or A, B, and C. And you're absolutely correct. I think Sandy and I are going to swap places with you. You guys come here and run the course and we'll listen to you. You're doing very well. It's a pleasure being here. That's the correct answer. Uh, you can grade the vertebral fractures either by literally measuring. Well, you don't do it. You just put the marker or your technician does and the computers calculate anterior height, posterior height, midpoint height. If there is a difference of more than 20%, 
then this patient has a vertebral compression fracture. If the difference is between the anterior and the posterior, this is a wedge. If it is between the midpoint and the others, it's a biconcave. If it is the anterior posterior compared to the one above or below, this is a crush vertebra. I'll show you some nice pictures in a couple of minutes, but that's excellent. Okay, conventionally, a vertebral compression fracture is diagnosed by the ratio between anterior midpoint and posterior height if it exceeds 20%, and we've got here A is 10, 15, 20, 25, And you're absolutely right, the convention is 20%. What is interesting is that at least one large multicenter international randomized clinical study looking at the efficacy of a medication for whatever reason, instead of using a cutoff point of 20%, which is the conventional, they use a cutoff point of 15%. Why? I was never clear. Uh, Sandy, do you have any comments? Uh, that was their convention at the time, and then they, re uh, they actually did a reanalysis of that data uh, and used the 20% uh, cut point and found uh, continued clinical significance of treatment. And But the convention is 20%. It's 20%, and, that, and that's a key factor. Okay, let's move on. Now, the following is or are true. In wedge compression fracture, anterior height of the vertebra is less than the posterior wedge, smaller anterior than posterior. Mm -hmm. Biconcave, the midpoint height, is less than the posterior or anterior. And in crush compression fracture, the heights of the vertebrae are less than the vertebra immediately below or above. And again, the cutoff point is 20%. And the majority is correct. It is the three statements are correct. Okay, let's move on. Multiple vertebral compression fractures are associated with loss of height, kyphosis, protuberant abdomen, and various combinations. <coughs> And that's very impressive, and the correct answer is E. These three are uh, associated with multiple vertebral compression fractures. Another question about the impact of multiple vertebral compression fractures, decreased pulmonary vital capacity, loss of self-esteem, depression, or combinations. And the majority is absolutely right. In fact, everybody is absolutely right here. The three are um, associated with multiple vertebral compression fractures. Okay, another true-false question. The identification of, of a morphometric silent vertebral compression fracture is an opportunity to diagnose and manage osteoporosis. That's the vertebral compression fracture incidentally discovered. Option B, morphometric vertebral compression fractures can be diagnosed by DEXA scans, by plain x-rays, CT, or MRI. And technetium scans are not useful to diagnose vertebral compression fractures.
That's a very interesting thing. Okay, so everybody agrees with A and B, but there is some question about C. You cannot use, I mean, there is a feature you see in localized increase in technetium uptake, but based on this localized increase on the technetium scan, it's not a good idea to diagnose vertebral compression fracture. It's much better to look at it. So identification um, is an opportunity to diagnose and manage this is correct. B is correct. Uh, this, they are not useful to diagnose osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures, and yeah, they're not useful. Sandy? Well, I think that, uh, we, uh, does everyone know what Technegium 99 uh, bone scanning, whole bo oh. body bone scanning is? If you, raise your hand if you know what it is. So about half the audience does not. So uh, basically this is an old technique, at least 30 years, of using a, this, uh, a uh, pyrophosphate, similar to what we use in medical therapy now. It's a pyrophosphate, diphosphonate agent that goes to bone just like our bisphosphonates do. And uh, this goes to any activity, meaning osteoblastic activity of bone. So this will be picked up by uh, abnormal bone, uh, whether it's fracture, whether it's osteoblastic disease, a variety of other uh, osteoarthritis, anything. Well, most things will pick up this uh, tracer. And so if you're not sure and the patient has chronic pain, one of the ways up to about, well, up to a year almost with Technegium 99, you would see potentially increased tracer activity with a previous fracture, old fracture. Today we use MR because it's, it's much more exacting. We, we have, a, and we're, we'll talk about this, as a better way of looking at acute and subacute fractures. But up to a year with technetium, you can pick up previous fractures or other disease processes as a screening tool. But you can't make a diagnosis of an osteoporotic fracture or vertebral fracture just based on it. You're looking for your uptake of that tracer, and it's a little bit different. So anything that increases the vascularity and while assessing patients for uh, metastasis is quite useful. You just inject some technetium, you look at the picture, and wherever there is an area of increased uptake is suggestive. Uh, of right, except in pure osteolytic disease yeah. where it will be negative, and we have to appreciate that. Okay, let's uh, move on. So what are the take-home messages? The first one is, again, we cannot emphasize this too much, Clinically silent morphometric vertebral compression fractures are diagnostic of osteoporosis and have the same implications as the clinical vertebral fractures. Morphometric fractures can be diagnosed by X-ray, BFA, DEXA scan, CT, and MRIs. Vertebral compression fractures could be wedged, biconcave, or crushed. I'll show you a few pictures in a few minutes. The type and severity of the fracture can be diagnosed visually or visually or by measuring the anterior midpoint and posterior height of individual vertebrae and comparing them. So these are uh, the VFAs, uh, sorry. Okay, now this is to show you to what extent a single vertebral fracture increases the risk of further fracture. So uh, the risk of hip fracture is increased if you have a single vertebral fracture the risk of hip fractures increased by 2.5. The risk of other vertebral fractures increased by 4.4, and the distal radius 1.7. If, on the other hand, the patient has sustained a hip fracture, her risk of having a contralateral hip fracture is increased by 2.3. Vertebrae, vertebral fractures, 2.3. Distal radius 1.9. And if the patient has sustained a distal fracture, a distal radial fracture, the risk of sustaining a vertebral fracture is increased by 1.4, and the risk of the contralateral radius being fractured is 3.3. So any vertebra increases the risk of, uh, sorry, any fracture increases the risk of other fractures. Uh, here you can see clearly a wedge vertebral fracture. 
and here you can see clearly a biconcave fracture. Uh, and here you can see other fractures. Um, you've got there's one. Sandy, can you see them better from where you are? I've got others. Okay. You can see there is one biconcave, and there is another one. You can see the midpoint is so much smaller than the posterior height and the anterior height, and there is another one here. How would you, uh, let me, oh, let's take a look at the previous one just for a second. How would everyone grade that right-hand image, the, the most right-hand image to you? This would that be a mild, moderate, or severe fracture? Severe, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's over 40% reduction in, in the height of that vertebra at the biconcave format. Yeah, the morphology is biconcave. But you can see even on the right-sided image, there's another fracture above it, right? Well, how would you grade that? One, two, or three, mild, moderate, or severe? Two. Yeah, so that would be a moderate fracture. So you, you guys are getting good. So you're, you're actually using the morphology of the fracture for diagnosis. And grade two and three have much more predictability than grade one on morphologic review. And that's a key issue because when you do, when you do a VFA at the same time you do a DEXA, and you can ask your, if you don't have DEXA in your, in your clinic, you can ask the uh, radiologic people, the radiologic suite that does it, to do a VFA on your patients. And if, they, if you have a diagnosis of fracture by VFA, that's your diagnosis, no matter what your DEXA shows. In other words, you have a clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis. And then that also, with the new modern technology in the DEXA machines, the software, that is introduced automatically into FRACs. So if you also want to look at FRACs with that verbal fracture, even though the patient has a diagnosis of osteoporosis, by that fracture, he, that's introduced automatically. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it, it, that's an excellent question. Did question. everyone hear it? So is VFA being paid for, being reimbursed? It depends on the state. If you're, on, if you're in CMS, yes. But if you're on a third-party payer and you, have, you don't have CMS, then it, it's questionable depending upon the state you practice in. What state are you in? Virginia. So I, I'm sorry, I don't know that. But uh, it's reimbursed at about, uh, I think it's about 26 to $30 per test. Okay, so it's not a high reimbursement. Uh, DEXA, do you know what the DEXA reimbursement is nationwide for non-facility? It's about $50. That's Medicare reimbursement. That's Medicare reimbursement. So uh, DEX has really taken a, a hit due to a CMS's reevaluation of, of this technology. Okay, let's move on. We've got a busy clinic. So let's move on to case number four. And uh, here we have a lady who's uh, 52 years old. She's referred by her orthopedic surgeon because she just sustained a Coolis fracture about three weeks ago after tripping over the carpet. So by definition, this is a fragility fracture. She reached surgical menopause at the age of 35 years, had uh, a uh, hysterectomy and bilateral orophorectomy for endometriosis. She hasn't been on HRT. She was asymptomatic up to the time of the fracture, and she's leading a sedentary lifestyle. She has a well-balanced diet, good daily calcium and vitamin D intake. She drinks about six cups of coffee and six cans of soda uh, drinks a day. Uh, she has one martini every day before dinner and two glasses of wine with dinner. She doesn't smoke cigarettes. Family history is negative for osteoporosis. And the question is consequences of... Um, a distal radius fracture, difficulty perfor difficulties performing daily activities, fair to poor function six months after fracture in about half of the patients, reflects sympathetic dystrophy, degenerative arthritis, 
and all of the above? And the correct answer is... And you're absolutely right, all of the above are complications. We often overlook that six months after the fracture, about half of the patients are still having difficulties coping with their daily activities. And this becomes particularly significant in older people living on their own. Now they need help to carry on their daily activities. So even though mortality is not that much increased, morbidity could be uh, quite significant. So Ecoulis fracture should not really be taken lightly. And the other thing to remember is that once the patient fractures, she's much more at risk of sustaining further fractures. So in Mrs. D's case at this stage, the fracture she sustained is a fragility fracture. Diagnosis is osteoporosis. We need the DEXA scan to establish the diagnosis. And we've got various combinations. And the answer is... And you guys are tremendous. This is absolutely correct. You do not need a DEXA scan to confirm the diagnosis. Diagnosis is made and confirmed, but you need the DEXA scan as a baseline for uh, future monitoring. Okay. In Mrs. D's case, factors predisposing to osteoporosis, surgical menopause, no HRT postmenopause, sedentary lifestyle, and all of the above. And you would be absolutely correct. All of the above uh, predispose to osteoporosis, surgical menopause. And I don't know about uh, the areas where you practice and the area I practice, East Tennessee. I see loads and loads of patients who had hysterectomies, bilateral orthorectomies in their late 20s, sometimes mid 30s, uh, for reasons that are not very clear. But the bottom line is these people are much more at risk of developing osteoporosis because of the short period during which the skeleton was exposed to estrogen. Yes, ma'am. I was under the impression that the June 2013 update to the National Osteoporosis Foundation guidelines removed risk fractures as being diagnostic of osteoporosis regardless of DMV. Yes. That, that was a, uh, a statement made by the NOF. It doesn't mean they're not fragility fractures. They could not come to a consensus. Correct. And so in my practice since that time, I have stopped telling my patients who have sustained a distal radius fracture based on a low trauma incident that they have osteoporosis irregardless of the bone density. Mm -hmm. I, I put it in fracts. You know, if I'm looking at osteopenic T scores, mm -hmm. but unlike hip or vertebral fractures, I thought that and it seemed to be like the previous question contradicted that that you had to do a bone density to to establish the diagnosis of osteoporosis. That this was not like a hip or vertebral fracture where they had osteoporosis regardless of the T score, yeah. as opposed to prior to June 13. Yeah, that was the uh, opinion of the NOF. But, but I think that was what was implied. Yeah. I think I, I think yeah. Right. I think we have to understand that this is a group of experts that feel that it's definitive when you have a hip and spine, but maybe not so much with other fractures. They couldn't come to a consensus, and that's why they did not include it. In your practices, the two of you, do you still consider a distal radius fracture to be osteoporosis regardless of the T-score? If it's a low trauma fracture? If it is a traumatic, yeah. Or yeah. low trauma. So you're pointing your finger at me. So I'm asking the two of you. So, uh, I mean, I, I want yeah. to know because this, this informs I know. Right. This is really a key issue for, for all of us in the bone world. 
And I think you'd have to also ask yourself, the patient falls to the ground and has bilateral sacral insufficiency fractures, or they fall to the ground without any trauma and have six rib fractures, whatever the case may be. From my standpoint, those are low energy, low trauma, fragility fractures. Uh, those are osteoporotic fractures from my standpoint. And that's what the pre-2013 guidelines said. Right, but you know, you have to look at guidelines for what they are. They're guidelines. They're not absolute dictatorial policy. So if you look at the ACR, uh, American uh, College of Rheumatology uh, guidelines on steroids, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, in premenopausal women and younger males, uh, do you really start medical therapy on high-dose glucocorticoids? And it says no. The, the thing that we have to appreciate is there's no data. There's absolutely no data, so they actually said in the, in the body of the text, we don't know. So they have to put down that we're not sure. And that's extrapolated by everyone to say, no, you don't treat. But in fact, if you have a young person that's on 60 to 80 milligrams of prednisone, for vasculitis, you have to watch these people or you have to consider prevention of osteoporotic fractures. I had a 32-year-old uh, young female physician who had eight vertebral fractures because she wasn't assessed and reviewed when she was on glucocorticoid therapy for Crohn's. You know, so I mean, you know, these are guidelines, but they're not absolute dictatorial policy and you have to use your clinical judgment. And that's a key issue for everything. We also know that once the patient fractures, she's much more at risk of sustaining another fracture. So if anything, I would look at this as an ideal opportunity to manage, manage the patient for osteoporosis. And I use the word manage rather than treat because you may decide, no, I'm not going to treat her. I'm not going to give her bisphosphonates or whatever it is, but I'm going to make sure she gets enough calcium, enough vitamin D, and doesn't lead a sedentary lifestyle doesn't drink so much uh, alcohol and what have you. So there are many other factors that you can do, but I, I personally wouldn't overlook a fragility fracture of the radius. Uh, if anything, I look at this as an opportunity to intervene, do something for the patient. If you, you know, I think if you look at Bob Lindsay, who's one of the uh, fathers of US uh, osteoporosis, originally wrote the NOF guidelines uh, years ago and established and helped establish the WA, WHO criteria. Uh, and I remember Bob telling, mentioning to me many years ago that most physicians don't recognize radial fractures, distal radial fractures, as an early or sentinel event prior to hip fracture or spine fracture. And so Bob knew this. I mean, this is a key issue for most of us in the field. You have to look at sentinel events as part of the overall picture of fragility in that patient. If you look at hip fractures, 45% of people that have hip fractures have pre-existing sentinel fractures. So we have to look at these as sentinel events prior to more significant skeletal fracturing, like hip and spine, or humeral fractures too. Those are, you didn't, they didn't include humeral fractures. And we know that humerus fractures, as we've discussed and we'll discuss further, are major fractures. That's a major fracture also, but not included in the NOF. It doesn't mean they're not important. It was the consensus at that time by the experts believed that those were the, were the points that they wanted to include. But and you have to think out of the box. We're clinicians. I was going to say it's also important to remember that these position development conferences and consensus conferences are done usually when you don't have very good uh, uh, evidence-based data. So it's based on what is available. And then you have a bunch of experts, they come and they say, in my opinion, this is what I would do. Uh, so again, I want to emphasize the fact that there are guidelines. Uh, what we do know is that once a fracture develops, the patient is much more at risk of sustaining other fractures. And in a patient like this, there are so many interventions that we can do regardless of whether we decide to use uh, some medication. Did that help you? Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Let's uh, move on. So the recommended daily calcium intake for postmenopausal women and men over 70 years of age is 
a thousand, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred, seventeen fifty, or two thousand. And the correct answer is B, 1,200 milligrams. This is according to the Institute of Medicine, their 2011 guidelines. Uh, the same guidelines, uh, vitamin D intake for postmenopausal women, men 70 years of age, is it 400, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, or 2,000? And the correct answer is... These are patients who have normal serum vitamin D levels. So you're not treating hypovitaminosis D. This is just the maintenance dose. And the majority is correct. The, according to the Institute of Medicine 2011, it is 1,000 units. The recommended daily upper limit of calcium intake for postmenopausal women and men 70 years and of age and older, again according to the Institute of Medicine 2011, and the correct answer is upper limit calcium intake. And again, according to the Institute of Medicine, the upper limit is 2,000 milligrams of intake. Now, it's very, very difficult, I believe almost impossible, to exceed 2,000 milligrams calcium intake daily from food. But it's so easy to get vitamin D supplements uh, over the counter. Uh, chewable, you don't even need a sip of water to take them. And I see quite a few patients who are taking mega dose of vitamin D, and then they come with kidney stones. I don't understand if you understand. Calcium, not vitamin D, calcium. That's the calcium, yeah. yeah. So upper limit for calcium, uh, 2,000. And as I was saying, very difficult to get more than 2,000 consistently from diet, 2,000 milligrams of calcium but it's easy to get over 2,000 by taking supplements. Okay, uh, the next one is a bit of a tricky question. There is convincing, that's the key word, convincing evidence that the following increases the risk of osteoporosis, excessive sodium, excessive caffeine, excessive carbonated drinks, excessive alcohol intake. And this could be a misnomer, what... Uh, we refer by this as soda drinks as opposed to carbonated drinks. Okay, so excessive sodium intake has how, the, how can this predispose to osteoporosis? Increased calcium excretion. The more you take sodium uh, that is not needed by the body, the more it goes in the urine. It also drags along uh, the calcium with it. Uh, excessive caffeine intake, Sandy, you've got the hot thing about this. <laughs> I think that uh, it depends upon who you read, but if you look at the vitamin D and calcium experts worldwide, you're talking about uh, exchange. So people that drink a lot of coffee don't drink or don't consume significant calcium in their dietary regimens. And uh, that, that's very similar to carbonated uh, high phosphorus uh, as well, seeming that uh, high carbonated phosphorus drinks also increase calcium excretion, but that's an exchange. People don't drink uh, milk. They don't take in a lot of dairy these days. And uh, that's one of the major issues uh, in our society. 
and alcohol. Everybody understands that. That's part of FRAX 2. Uh, that's important to note. Uh, does everyone know what excessive alcohol consumption is in regard to utilization of FRAX when you click off that button? Three or more. So it's over two drinks, two units. So it could be two and a half, too. So two units, meaning two shots, two beers, two moderate glasses of wine. Okay? So over that would be considered excessive and used in FRAX as potential future fracture risk in your assessment. Uh, the thing that I often see in my clinic is patients who reduce their calcium intake because they have a history of renal calculi. And they say, oh, my doctor told me not to consume too many dairy products. If you look at the evidence, there is actually some evidence to show that patients with renal calculi have fewer calculi if they get a good daily calcium intake from food. If they get it from supplements, then the risk increases. But if they get it from food, it's not increased. In fact, there is a study to show that in men, it is actually reduced. What increases the risk of renal calculi is red meat because of the sulfur-containing amino acid and an excessive salt intake. So a, a nice juicy burger is one of the worst things you could do if your patient has renal calculi because both the red meat and uh, the salt would increase the amount of calcium in the urine, would increase the risk of renal calculi. And we all have to appreciate that uh, the majority of stones are calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate stones, and you have to do an evaluation to be absolutely sure the patient doesn't have other potential etiologies. But as Ron had mentioned, uh, dietary calcium also binds oxalate. And so the stone experts uh, suggest dietary calcium is part of that, not calcium carbonate or citrate or anything supplement, but dietary calcium, which is, a, uh, which is different. Okay. Okay, let's move on. The next question is food rich in sodium include carbonated drinks, preserved canned food, deep sea fish, and various combinations. So there is agreement as far as A and B are concerned, but there is disagreement about deep sea fish. Does it contain a lot of sodium or it doesn't? Depends if you wash the fish before cooking or if you take it from the sea and... Sandy? So, uh, you know, I think that uh, from my standpoint, it doesn't have increased sodium per se. But going back to the carbonated drinks, carbonation by itself is not the problem. It is the high sodium that we see in soft drinks, as, as Ron had mentioned, with increased excretion of calcium. The uh, exchange, meaning people drink lots of sodas, but they don't have dairy, and possibly phosphorus, phosphoric acid and things like that increasing also the excretion. But uh, from the standpoint of carbonation, there's no prospective data, long-term data, good data, saying that just carbonation, per se, is an issue. And the same thing with preserved and canned foods. Is there a lot of sodium in it? Of course. And, and that's a key issue in the American diet, worldwide diet, too. Okay, let's move on. Cigarette smoking stimulates bone resorption inhibits bone formation, increases the risk of osteoporosis, and various combinations.
So there is agreement as far as C is concerned. It does increase the risk of osteoporosis. There is disagreement about whether it stimulates bone resorption or inhibits bone formation. And the opinions are really very divided there, equally divided. Sandy, anything you want to say? So, you know, you have inhibition of bone formation uh, with cigarette smoking, cap, uh, nicotine. There is a major influence on, on the skeleton. And it's one of the risk factors in FRAX. Okay. The following physical exercises increase bone mass most. Resistive, endurance, swimming, resistive and endurance, and then E, all physical exercises increase bone mass. And the answer is? And it's uh, D is the correct answer. You need a combination of resistive and endurance to increase most. So resistive and endurance combination is the best, followed by resistive and uh, endurance are the least. Swimming is not associated with an increased bone density, probably because there is no gravity involved. Okay, so let's wrap up as far as this case is concerned. Our take-home messages, again, fragility fractures. All this session is on diagnosis, so we cannot emphasize too much this factor that fragility fractures are diagnostic of osteoporosis. Fragility of the uh, fractures of the distal radius are associated with increased morbidity and loss of independence. Risk factors for osteoporosis include a low daily calcium intake, excessive alcohol, and possibly caffeine intake and the number of medications. Recommended daily calcium, vitamin D intake, and upper limits are established as, at least as far as the Institute of Medicine is concerned. And most physical exercises, but not all of them, increase bone mass. Uh, you've got this in your uh, handout. These are the factor, factors that increase fracture risk. On this side, factors affecting bone strength, and on the other side, factors increasing the risk of falls. And um, you really should bear in mind that fracture risk is increased by low bone mineral density, low quality bone, but also <clears throat> increased fracture risk. Uh, you also should have this in your handout. This is the Institute of Medicine recommendation. 2011, and you can track it on uh, the website. And I've also got uh, a series of uh, average calcium content of various foods uh, per serving size. And this is quite useful because patients often do not know what uh, a serving size is and how much calcium. The other thing is that on the food labels, they don't usually say how many milligrams of calcium Per serving, they say what is the percentage. So to change percent to milligrams, you just add a zero. So if on the label it says that one portion uh, has 20% of calcium, it means 200 milligrams. It is based on the calcium requirement of a young, healthy adult patient. I saw some people looking at their handouts. It is in the handout. This, it is not. Okay, we'll make sure, if you leave your email with Mandy, we'll make sure all this is emailed to you. <coughs> okay, are we ready to move on to case five? Mrs. E. Uh, Sorry, yes, sir. I have one question. Do you study that a lot of patients could be increased calcium because of increased bone density? Or do you have The question is about increased calcium intake and the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, this is a paper that was published in the BMJ about, what, three, four years ago. Uh, I still have patients tell me that, that they don't want to take their calcium. Right. The short answer I give them is that it's not correct. I'm sorry, I 
the short answer I give them is that the information there is not correct. The study that was done and published in the BMJ about three, four, maybe five years ago, uh, the quality of the study is very, very poor. Uh, it is more of an epidemiological study than anything else. Uh, most of us, at least I'm very surprised it was published in the BMJ. Okay. Um, the, um, the other thing to remember is that you need to differentiate the people who are deficient in calcium or vitamin D and the people who are replenished. So if you have a patient who's got a very low vitamin D level, um, uh, you need to replenish the vitamin D first and then you need the minimum recommended daily calcium intake. Uh, if you have less than this, then the patient may run into a negative calcium balance and this may adversely affect bone mass. But if you also increase it too much, it, won't be, uh, it will be absorbed because now you're forcing the absorption across the gastrointestinal tract, and this would result in hypercalciuria and increased risk of kidney stones. The effect as to whether or not calcium increases the risk of ischemic heart disease is very, very questionable. And if you look at the study in detail and really read it thoroughly, there are so many pitfalls. As I said, it is surprising it's been published. So I just tell the patients it's not a very good study. On the other hand, we have enough evidence that this is how much calcium vitamin D you should be getting, Sandy. So the study was uh, published with uh, Bollard and uh, Ian Reed from, uh, I think it was New Zealand. And they looked at uh, retrospectively uh, major studies that had already been published in a prospective way. For example, the WHI Women's Health Initiative study was one of the larger studies that were included in their meta-analysis of cardiovascular risk and calcium intake. And they came to the conclusion that in those uh, WHI sub-protocols that used calcium and D, there was increased risk of cardiovascular events. However, if you look at the WHI uh, group, meaning the actual group that analyzed the WHI, they looked at the same data and said, there's no increased risk in these patients. In the same uh, uh, Bullard uh, group, they also used the RECORD study from the UK, which was a calcium study uh, to look at decreased fractures and things like that, and saw increased risk of cardiovascular events. When you look deeply into the study, there was a significant non-adherence to therapy so most, at least 50% were not even taking their calcium. The cardiovascular events that they were uh, using as proof that there was increased risk were not primary events. So they weren't primary endpoints. There was a retrospective analysis looking at death certificates and things like that. So it's controversial, to say the least. We're not saying there couldn't be. But at this point in time, as Ron had mentioned, it's very controversial. This is an important element, for a mineral for bone, and we, as uh, individuals that practice in this field, believe that dietary calcium is the best. Okay? If the patient cannot take dietary calcium, then we have to uh, utilize sufficient calcium. Otherwise, we see mineralization defects in bone and that's not treatable with our osteoporosis medical therapies, our pharmacologic therapies. So the long and the short of it is it's controversial. The cardiologists have picked up on this, and they're telling their patients don't take any calcium. This is, has everyone seen this? And so this, are there any cardiologists out here? Okay. So uh, this is very frequent, and so we reassure our patients Certainly, we want to use dietary calcium, greens, yogurt, Greek yogurt, as was saying, is 300 milligrams per serving. So we try to uh, encourage dietary calcium, and that has not been associated with any increased risk. Okay. Does that answer your question, sir? Okay. okay, thank you. Let's move on. We've still got a few patients. So case number five is about a 68-year-old white woman who is asymptomatic, she had a DEXA scan as part of her screening. Uh, the recommendation is to screen all women aged 65 years and older, regardless of whether or not they have risk factors. So this is why this lady was um, scanned. And the T-score of her left total hip is minus 2.8. 
Um, she is asymptomatic. Annual physical exam done a few weeks previously did not reveal any significant findings. The various laboratory tests are all within normal limits, and her family history is negative for osteoporosis. So essentially, a apparently healthy woman uh, had her DEXA scan, and it shows a T-score of minus 2.8 in the left um, total hip. So these are the various options. Osteoporosis should be investigated and treated. Densitometric evidence is an, of osteoporosis is a Z-score of minus 2.5 or lower. Densitometric <laughs> evidence of osteopenia is a T-score higher than minus 2.5, and then we've got various combinations. So we seem to have consensus that she has osteoporosis because her T-score is minus 2.8, which is less than 2.5. 2.5 is the line differentiating osteopenia from osteoporosis. If it is minus 2.5 or lower in the total hip, femur, and neck, or lumbar vertebrae, the densitometric diagnosis is osteoporosis in a patient of that age. Uh, so this is non-controversial. She has osteoporosis. It should be investigated and treated. How much investigated, how much treated, we'll talk about this uh, later on. Then symptomatic evidence of osteoporosis is not the Z-score, the T-score. A T-score of minus 2.5 or lower, and nobody bought this, which is very reassuring. Then symptomatic evidence of osteopenia is a T-score higher than minus 2.5, and this is the defining line, minus 2.5 and lower is osteoporosis, minus 2.5 to minus 1, lower than minus 1 is osteopenia, minus 1 and higher is normal. Are we okay with this one? Yes, sir. Significance of the Z-score more than no the T-score is the number of standard deviation the patient's density is compared to a normal, young, healthy reference population. Z-score compares the patient to other um, uh, people of the same age. And the nearest analogy, the, well, the reason the T-score is used as opposed to the Z-score is that if you use the Z-score, you are comparing the patient to other people of her age, who fracture more. So if you want to find out how much more at risk is she of sustaining a fracture, you don't really want to compare her to somebody of her age, but to a healthy person whose fracture risk is very low, that is, young, healthy adults. And this is why they're using the uh, T-score. Uh, the reason they picked up on minus 2.5 is that it's known that patients of the age of 50, about 30%, one-third, sustain a fracture. One third of the people over the age of 50 have a T-score minus 2.5. And when the World Health Organization came up with this classification in the, what, 60s, 70s, late 60s or 50s? 96. 1996? Really? Well, it was, it was... That was the final, the last one, 1996. Mm -hmm. But uh, when they were looking, when they were still doing these studies, uh, this is how they decided on a T-score of minus 2.5 uh, as the drawing, kind, the defining line. The thing to remember is that they were not looking at who to treat, who not to treat. What they were looking at are the patients likely to fracture. And being sponsored by the World Health Organization, they, you're right actually, it's 1994. Uh, when, they, um, uh, when the World Health Organization looked at this, their main concern was how prevalent is the condition in different parts of the world. They were not using it to say who should be treated, who should not be treated. So, so, you're, so, so that's clear to everyone. So this was an association using DEXA at, at the three sites, the spine, hip, and forearm, and looking at the population to determine the percentage that would have osteoporosis by bone density testing at those three sites 
which as Ron said is about 30% or so. And the lifetime risk in, in women, postmenopausal women, what's their risk of fracture? And it turned out that if they chose minus 2.5 T-score, it's close, 30%, 30 some percent, and 40%. <coughs> That's how they came up with that threshold. The nearest analogy I use <clears throat> frequently with my residents, I tell them when you want to judge how good a student is doing, you can compare the student to the rest of the class in this particular school, or you compare, can compare the student with the national average. Which one of the two do you think is going to give you a better idea of how the student is vis-a-vis -vis a normal population, an average population. Which one of the two? Would you use the school where the student is or would you use a national average? Use a national average, okay, because it's so much broader and it takes in a lot of variations. And there's the same thing with the T and Z score. If you use a Z score, you're comparing the patient to her peers. Now, if everybody fractures, it's, it's not very consoling. Same thing as if you compare the student with the rest of this class within that school, and the school happens to be to be bad, okay, and everybody flunks uh, the exam. It's not really reassuring for that student to be the same as his peers if everybody flunks the exam, as opposed to the national average. And this is why T-score, we use a young, healthy adult population. Now, there is a very big thorny issue that we'll talk about it later, do you use a female reference population or a male reference population? And we can spend the rest of the conference just talking about this, but we are not going to address it now, but later on. But the bottom line is the convention is to use the T-score, which is comparing the patient to a young, healthy, adult, normal population. And... So there's a marked score between the Z Uh, so, can you repeat the question, please? So the question is, uh, if there is a very significant discordance between T and Z, say a Z score of minus two and a T score of zero, would you be concerned about secondary etiologies? Is that what the question is? So the issue is, in early in life, the T and Z scores are close, are almost identical as your modeling bone. Later in life, the T scores and Z scores will be different. So the T-scores will be lower usually than the Z-scores because you're comparing Z-scores to age-matched groups. We know that in the past, people have used that minus 2 Z-score as an extra concern that there are secondary etiologies for uh, osteoporosis in this patient, and that has not been proven. So the long and the short of it, no. And the NOF has come up with a, the, their recent 2013 uh, uh, guidelines that state all patients with osteoporosis should be evaluated for secondary etiologies, other potential risk factors that are not included in just doing a DEXA uh, because frequently there are secondary etiologies that must be treated prior to institution of pharmacologic therapy. So everyone should, with osteoporosis documented by bone density testing, should be evaluated. So just don't use just the Z minus two and be concerned and everyone else is okay. Everyone should be evaluated. Does that answer your question, sir? You're welcome. Okay, let's move on. So uh, the next question is about who should be screened for osteoporosis. And we have women aged 65 years and older, regardless of the presence of risk factors. Men 70 years of age and older, regardless of risk factors. Women 50 years and older with risk factors, if their fracture risk exceeds that of a hypothetical woman 65 years and older, and adults who have sustained fragility fractures, or all of them.
and I think most people have seen through. We did say earlier on, if we have a fragility fracture, it is diagnostic of osteoporosis. You do not need a DEXA scan to uh, confirm the diagnosis. So the correct answer is women 65 years and older, men 70 years and older, women 50 years and older, if they have risk factor for osteoporosis. Once they develop a fragility fracture, it's uh, a different kettle of fish completely. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Screening for osteoporosis can be done by fracture risk assessment, DEXA of the phalanges, ultrasound of the calcaneus, and various combinations. Nobody wants to answer this? Okay, we've got consensus that fracture risk assessment is quite useful to screen patients for osteoporosis. Nobody bought the DEXA of the phalanges, quite rightly. A couple of people said that ultrasound of the calcaneus can be used to screen for osteoporosis. And if you look at large epidemiological studies, there is a good correlation between heel ultrasound and fracture risk, including fracture risk of the hip. The concern, however, is that uh, you will get quite a few false negative results. Fracture risk assessment, on the other hand, does not uh, take into account, as you've heard earlier this morning, about the number of falls, about any falls the patient may have, and it's got a lot of other drawbacks. It is used. Sandy, what would you use? So uh, this is a complicated question that Ron came up with, okay? <laughs> and so I, want, I would like to reassure everyone this was not my question. This is, this is Ron's question. We're going to all get to know each other well by the end of three days, right? So uh, as Ron had mentioned, DEXA, the phalanges, is associated with fracture risk. I mean, actually... Uh, that and radiogrammetry and other things lower the uh, uh, assessment, meaning the actual uh, result shows increased risk. QUS is definitely associated with increased risk, but you cannot use these technologies with the WHO criteria, correct? So, yes, they can provide risk assessment, but they cannot be used to make a diagnosis by the WHO criteria. Fracture risk assessment, let's look at FRAX. So let's look at uh, FRAX and use that. Can you assess risk based on FRAX? And, and the answer is yes. Can you use it as a screening tool for osteoporosis? Well, in fact, in the UK, they don't do DEXAs, okay? They just do FRAX without bone density testing, and uh, the... NOS and the other, and uh, NOG, which is like uh, their society that reviews potential guidelines for DEXA and other, uh, and medical therapies, and et cetera, et cetera, suggests that if a patient has a FRAX of a certain level, then, then they should have a DEXA. If they have high risk based on FRAX without DEXA, treat. So it depends upon where you, where you practice medicine and how you use FRAX, that it can be used without uh, bone density testing. The National Alliance uh, for Bone in the U.S. is suggesting, and this is published data, that FRAX scores uh, major osteoporosis sites of 20% or greater, or 3% at the hip or greater, should be used as a definition of osteoporosis. This is published uh, last year, I believe. And so... The whole field is evolving into these other areas. And so I think for the screening of osteoporosis, you can use uh, many of these, uh, the different 
uh, technologies or fracs to uh, assess patients, but the actual diagnosis is based on bone density testing or the patient sustaining a fragility fracture. Does that answer your question? <laughs> sure it does. Sure it does. Because I would, I would choose A, B, C. Because, yes, you can use DEX of the phalanges to give you fracture risk. You can use radiogrammetry of the, of the finger to look at fracture risk because it does correlate with forearm DEX, I say, but doesn't give you a diagnosis. Can you use ultrasound of the calcaneus to assess fracture risk? And, yes, you can definitively. How about fracture risk assessment using our tools that can assess for osteoporosis? Ron didn't give us none of the above, so we have to make a choice here. Okay. The key word is screening. We're not trying to diagnose or screen. It doesn't say diagnosis. It We're says trying screen. to screen, and this, this is the main emphasis. Here yeah, there are many, many screening tools. There are many questionnaires that you can use, but these are just screening, not diagnostic. From then, we hope that we're not going to end up as in England, where they use the FRAX to determine who's going to be treated. And they actually treat patients just based on the FRAX if the FRAX exceeds a certain uh, number, which is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, now, I accept this for underdeveloped countries where they may not have enough DEXs, and you say, well, by and large, we should be able to do this. But for a developed country to say we're going to use the FRAX to determine who's going to be treated or not, uh, I hope we don't get to that stage. Um, let's move on because we've got 18 minutes left for this morning session. Uh, during DEXA scans, two low energy waves are, are directed at the patients. During the scan, the bone surface area and mineral content are calculated. The bone mineral density is a derived measurement. And then we've got various combinations. And everybody seems to agree, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut this short. It is correct, we use two uh, waves of energy. Uh, we measure the bone surface area and then the mineral content, divide one by the other to calculate the density. So the BMD is a uh, derived measurement. If conditions permit, the following bones should be scanned during a DEXA scan one or both hips, the upper four lumbar vertebrae, the distal radius, this is a trick question, um, A and B, or A, B and C. That's close, very close. This is going to take 18 minutes to discuss. Can we get it? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's very, very close. The recommendations of the ISCD, International Society of Clinical Densitometry, and the World Health Organization is to make a diagnosis. You look at the hip, and at the hip specifically, you look at one of two sides, the lowest of the total hip or the femoral neck. You do not look at the trochanter, you do not look at the intertrochanteric area, you certainly do not look at the wounds area. You only look at the total and the femoral neck and pick up the lowest of the two. You also look at the upper four lumbar vertebrae, and as we said earlier this morning, you need a minimum of two vertebrae. So you take the lowest T-score of the total hip, femoral neck, or at least two lumbar vertebrae. If for whatever reason you cannot look at these sites, let's say the patient had a bilateral hip replacement, or the patient had um, some orthopedic surgery on her back, then you look at the distal radius, and the site you look at is only the one-third site or 33% site. If we have time later on, we'll discuss why this site. But the diagnosis of osteoporosis is based on the lowest T-score, total hip, femoral neck, and at least two lumbar vertebrae. Failing this, you look at the radius. Are we okay? Let's move on because I'd like to finish with this case. Uh, this is an important one. Characteristics of a well-positioned hip scan include 
the long axis of the femur should be perpendicular to the region of interest horizontal axis. Soft tissue should be visualized on the lateral border of the femur. And how prominent is the lesser trochanter? And then you've got various combinations. And we have consensus here, majority votes for all three. And all three are terribly important to determine whether a hip is well positioned or not. And here we have the long axis of the femur should be perpendicular to the horizontal line of the region of interest. Uh, there should be soft tissue surrounding the femur. Otherwise, the algorithm differentiating soft tissue from bone tissue will not be properly applied. Uh, the lesser trochanter should be barely visible. I'll show you examples of very prominent lesser trochanters. Uh, the position of the box or the line, the femur neck box, which is this rectangular box, should only contain the femur neck and not parts of the pelvis. And if there is no way of doing it without including part of the pelvis, there is a software to actually eliminate the part of the pelvic bone and I'll show you how you can judge whether it has been done or not. The femur and neck box is positioned differently with the hologic densitometers than the lunar. I'll show you an example in a minute or not. And the femur and neck box, as I said, should only include the femur and neck. So uh, the G lunar places the femur and neck box, this rectangular box, at the midpoint of the hip axis. Measures the hip axis, goes for the midpoint, and places the femur and neck box, and says this is what we are going to call the femur and neck. Her logic, on the other hand, anchors the femur and neck box to the greater trochanter, and say this is the area we're going to look at. Most of the time, the two are very close to each other, but sometimes, as in this case here, there is quite a discrepancy. And this is very important to remember if you are monitoring the patient following her sequentially, if at baseline it's done with the hologic, and then two years later it's done with the lunar, you really cannot compare the two. Because anatomically they're looking at two different sites. Uh, lesser trochanter should be barely visible. This is a very nice uh, scan. It's well done. Uh, perpendicular soft tissue all around it. Femur and neck box only contains the femur and neck. It's obviously a hologic because it is anchored to the greater trochanter and it doesn't contain any of the pelvic bones. Uh, trochanter here is quite prominent. Now this could be because the patient has quite a bit of osteoarthritis and the technician was not able to position her properly, but it behooves the technician to make a note that this is the best position she could get given the fact that the patient is in pain and could not be properly positioned. And it's important because when you're going to monitor this patient two years later, ideally you want the patient to be put in exactly the same position, even though maybe two years later she's able to be in a better position. Um, I hope you can see the femur neck box there. And you can see it's not possible to scan this patient without the femur and neck box, including some bit of the pelvic bone. And the same thing here. So what the technician has done, she's excluded everything to the right of this line. So now the femoral box doesn't see that part of the pelvic bone, which had to be included in that rectangular box. So characteristics of a well-positioned forearm scan now is the radius and ulna are parallel to each other and centered. There should be one row of carpal bone visible. And the dense cortical bone in the distal radius is excluded from the region of interest. And then we have various combinations. Cast your votes, please. And we do have consensus. The three are important uh, criteria to judge whether the uh, radius scan is good or not. 
And there it is, this area here. Sorry, the two bones should be parallel to each other. Again, there should be the soft tissue. You want to see one row of carpal bones, but you want to exclude everything close to that area, increased area of density. And as I said earlier, even though you look at the ultradistal, the mid, and the one-third, and the total, it's only the distal one-third that, sorry, this one, the distal one-third that is taken into account, distal one-third of the radius. If we have time later on, and we will have plenty of time, we'll talk about why this is so. Again, if the scan is not, if the patient is not properly positioned, you cannot use the scan to make any decision. Don't forget, you're not measuring the absolute values. What you're measuring is how does the patient compare to the reference population. If your technologist positions the patient in a different way than conventionally, that comparison becomes invalid. So in DEXA terminology, the T-score is the number of standard deviations the patient's BMD is compared to an age match reference population. The Z-score is the standard deviation of the patient's BMD compared to an age match population. And in postmenopausal women and men 50 years and older, only the T-score can be used to make a diagnosis. Okay, so uh, the T-score number of sand deviation, patient BMD compared to that of a gender match reference population, this is one of the controversial issues, uh, especially as far as men are concerned. Do you use a male reference population or do you use a female reference population? I'll just give you the end result at present as we speak. The uh, International Suprosis Foundation recommends that men be compared with a female Caucasian reference population. The National Suprosis Foundation here in the U.S. recommends that men be compared to men. ISCD, the International Suprosis, the, National, uh, the International Society, Society for Clinical Densitometry uh, endorses the IOF, but for whatever reason they say, guys, you do whatever you want to at the end of the day. Uh, which pose, poses a lot of problems that maybe we can talk about it later on. Uh, but this is the situation as we stand now. NOF says compare men to men. IOF says compare men to women. ISCD says do whatever you want to. But we endorse the IOF recommendations. That's in a nutshell, isn't it, Sandy? And, and that's the latter. That's exactly what's being done now. And we can talk about it at greater length when we have time. Right. But uh, men are women. <laughs> in regard to baseline reference database for good reasons, for good reasons, and we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, this one, the Z-score, number of standard deviation, the patient's BMD compared to an age match population, that's correct. And in postmenopausal women and men 50 and older, the T-score is used to make a diagnosis, not the Z-score, and we touched on this earlier. While applying the World Health Organization guideline, the lowest of the following bones, we've already talked about this, it's the lowest of the total hip, femur, and neck, or two lumbar vertebrae. And if this doesn't work, it's uh, the distal radius, the, the distal one-third radius that should be taken into account. Wounds area cannot be taken into consideration, same as the greater trochanter should not be taken into account. Um, Wow, that's good.
Majority has it. Um, when we look at the forearm, it's only the distal one-third or the 33% radius site that we look at to make a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Uh, we don't look at the total radius and ulna. We don't look at the total radius. We don't look at the ultra-distal. We don't look at the mid. To make a diagnosis, we only look at the 33% distal, or it's also called the one-third uh, signs. The World Health Population Guidelines are based on a Caucasian postmenopausal population, or is it based on a multiracial, all-age female population, a Caucasian male and female population over the age of 40, a multiracial female or male population over 40, a multinational male and female over the age of 40 years. And the majority are correct. It is based on a Caucasian female uh, population. Okay, these are the take-home messages. I'm going to go over them very, very quickly. Just to remind you that osteoporosis is usually silent until a fraction occurs. However, given the mortality and morbidity, and I hope we've illustrated this quite well, um, associated with fracture, there is a need to screen for osteoporosis following should be screened for osteoporosis, and this is according to the U.S. Preventative Task Force, women 65 years and older, men 70 years and older, and adults who have sustained a fracture. The World Health Organization then set a metric classification based on postmenopausal Caucasian women, based on the lowest T-score, femoral neck, total hip, at least two lumbar vertebrae, and if none of the above bones can be interpretable, then the radius is concerned. T-score is the number of standard deviation the patient's BMD is compared to that of a reference population. According to the WHO densitomatic classification, osteoporosis minus 2 or lower, normal minus 1 or higher, in between the two is osteopenia. And we've gone over the uh, features of a well-positioned hip scan, this is the forearm, uh, and the lumbar vertebrae, we talked about it in the first case. So the only two direct measurements that we make during DEXA is to measure the bone mineral content and the surface area of the bone scan. One is divided by the other to calculate the bone mineral density. The patient's bone density is compared to a young, healthy adult reference population applying this formula to calculate the T-score, which is then used to make a diagnosis. And this is repetitious, minus 2.5 and lower, osteoporosis, minus one and higher, normal, in between the two, osteopenia. Because this is such a big group, you need some guidance to determine should we treat or shouldn't we treat. If your patient has osteoporosis, you're probably going to treat her. If she's normal, you're going to congratulate her, tell her to come back maybe in two years' time. If she's got osteopenia, it's much more difficult. We know intuitively that a patient who's got a T-score of minus 2.4 and a patient who's got a T-score of minus 1, both are in the osteopenic range. Intuitively, we know that the one with a T-score of minus 2.4 is much more at risk of a fracture than one whose T-score is minus 1. So you probably will treat minus 2.4, you won't treat minus 1.1. But as you get closer to the midpoint, it becomes very tricky, and this is where the FRAC score is quite useful because it tells you your patient has osteopenia, but her, but her fracture risk exceeds a certain level. And the level is 3% for the risk of hip fracture, 20% for the risk of uh, a major fracture. And you would treat, or you'd be inclined to treat, the ones who have a fracture risk of 3% or more for the hip, 20% or more for the other bone, and not treat the others, but again, I need to emphasize your ultimate decision of treating or not treating should not really be based on any single figure. You should use, evaluate the patient as a whole, and you remember when we were talking about the risk of falls, we were saying one of the major drawbacks of the FRAC score doesn't take into account the risk of fracture. 
as opposed to the Garvin one. If you have time, we'll talk more uh, about it. Okay, it's uh, 9.31. Uh, to, yes, ma'am. The guy, the, so what do you do with an early postmenopausal woman who is 35 years old or 40? Well, this is where you really need to look at the patient and evaluate her completely and not just look at one risk factor. So the two main things that, have been, that we've been trying to tell you is when you evaluate your patient, you look at bone factors and you look at false factor. And there are so many permutations based on these two osteoporosis or bone status and fall risk, you decide, I'm going to treat that patient even though her frax is below the convention, even though, uh, she, um, uh, so she, even though she has osteopenia and even though her fracture risk is, let's say, 2% hip, 10% major, so it's below the threshold, because the patient has a peripheral neuropathy, has autonomic neuropathy, has orthostasis, I'm going to treat her. I need her to have as strong bones as uh, she could have. Now, if the bone density is normal, giving any of the medication for osteoporosis will not touch her, will not do anything. Uh, but if she's got osteopenia, then you would treat her. So again, the, the important thing is you need to evaluate the patient on a case-by-case -case, uh, format, and your evaluation should include bone factors for osteoporosis, false factors for the patient. You may find it's uh, much better to give the patient two pairs of glasses, one for distant vision, one for near vision, than to uh, initiate treatment. But again, this is a decision that has to be made individually. And I'm just surprised that there are no guidelines for uh, screening. There cannot be, uh, or there are, sorry, there are guidelines for screening. So the screening guidelines are women 65 years and older, Yeah, but these are the guidelines, and they're not that old. The U.S. Preventive Task Force. When were the guidelines the last? Yeah, uh, the, there's new NOF guidelines too that just came out. So the, I think there's a, an important issue in what you're asking or stating. If the patient is a 50-year-old female, has no other clinical risk factors, there's no family history, there's no secondary etiologies, there's nothing else. You would not screen that patient with a bone density test, okay? Those are all, those, that's across the board looking at all guidelines out there. You would not, and because otherwise you're going to screen the entire postmenopause, immediate postmenopause, and all post, postmenopausal women in the United States. If you do that, you're going to break the bank. So you have to look at what, you, what is the bang for your buck? Are you going to really make a difference knowing what that patient's bone density is without any risk factors? We're talking about nothing, okay? And all guidelines say do not screen the general public, okay? That, that's different if you do have uh, important clinical risk factors. It is a, it depends. So in, if you don't have a family history of osteoporosis, your parents, your grandparents, your great parents, nobody is fractured. Okay, you have no other etiologies, no secondary etiology. You're on calcium and D. Certainly you can check a vitamin D level because half the population is vitamin D insufficient or deficient. But you would not necessarily screen that 50-year-old woman who has no clinical risk factors and there's no, meaning no family history of fractures. Because why, what would you do if you found osteopenia in that individual? A T-score of minus 1.2. Do you really think you're going to treat that patient? What would you do if you found osteoporosis? Because if, if you found, let's say you, uh, more commonly you would find a patient with a T-score of minus 2.2 or minus 2.3 then what would your diagnosis be? It would be osteopenia in a peri- or postmenopausal, immediate postmenopausal woman. She has no clinical risk factors. There's no family history. You've checked her for secondary etiologies. She has no secondary etiologies. Why does she have a T-score of minus 2.3 then? You answer me. 
Tell me why she has a, a T score of minus 2.3. But why does she have a low T score? Yes. She did. No, she didn't. She has no clinical risk factors. The, the answer is that's her genetic peak. Okay? So if you look at a T score of zero in a population of, 40, say, 40 year old women, and she has a T score of zero, what percentage of the population is above zero? I mean the average, and what is the percent below average? 50 and 50. So you're gonna see 50% of those individuals with T-scores with that are below zero in the immediate postmenopausal period due to less than average peak bone mass. That doesn't necessarily mean they lost it, they never had it. They are not at increased risk for fracture. I dare you to frax that patient, with, and they will be low. They will. Yes, and they will have low fracture risk. And frax does a better job in regard to predicting fracture risk, future fracture risk, than BMD alone. That was the problem years ago, when physicians, clinicians. We're treating all immediate postmenopausal women with osteopenia. We were over-treating. There is published data looking at the Manitoba study, 40,000 people, 40,000 individuals prospectively assessed over up to about 10 years. At that time, published around four years of data showing that at looking at that population, women who had a low bone area, small women, who we know have low bone density, and, and looking prospectively at their low T-scores and following them, they had no increased fracture risk. So that now, that doesn't mean later on in life, when you start out with a T-score of minus 2.3, that they don't have increased risk of fracture when they're you know, 70 or so, because who's going to reach the fracture, the osteoporosis cut point, or increased fracture risk <laughs> as you age, right? And you lose about with age-related bone loss, 1% per year after the acute postmenopausal time frame. So it's, it's not accepted that you treat all postmenopausal, immediately postmenopausal women without clinical risk factors with osteopenia who have, who have no history in their family of osteoporosis. And that goes back to Ron's statement, you, you individualize the patient's risk. You determine if you wish to uh, assess that patient in two years, three years, five years, based on their bone density and all their clinical risk factors for intervention. Do you want to intervene with osteoporosis therapies or prevention therapies? <laughs> so we have not discussed prevention of osteoporosis using a potentially different medical therapies and different doses of medicines, okay? The last question. That, that you have to take into, into account what their fracture risk is. So How did they develop it? Characteristically, those people have other potential early in life issues when you go through their history. But the NOF suggests treating those individuals. Okay, we need to uh, draw this session to a close and it's preparing for the next session, which is to uh, develop a treatment strategy for individual patients. Um, it's uh, 20 to 10. Could you please be back just before 10 so that we can start our next session at 10? Thank you very much for coming.